Good morning. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I am, as he says, Bruce Pato, the general manager of Nebraska g and Nebraska g and has 22 members, uh, 21 of which are public power districts, and one is a co-op, such as Barry's been talking about. Uh, we uh, sell basically retail. Our members sell retail in the eastern two-thirds of, uh, of Nebraska, with the exception, obviously, of the rural area that OPBD serves. Pretty much everything else in the rural area uh, is our members. Um, we, uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so all of this is just fluff. Um, we set a peak last year, or this year, I should say, about 1,100 megawatts uh, on peak, and we have an extensive uh, load management uh, program within our, our membership uh, that pushes about 300 megawatts off into the off-peak. So our off-peak was somewhere around 13, 1400 megawatts. Uh, nearly 5 million uh, megawatt hours uh, are sold as well. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to give you some of the perspective of our membership. Uh, we've had these uh, opinions uh, since basically day one, and they're very basic. Uh, and we appreciate the opportunity to share those. Uh, Ron and, and Barry had two great presentations uh, depicting what's been going on in Colorado and Missouri. Uh, as you can tell, uh, there are some similarities with their organizations and ours, uh, but again, they're two separate states and they are different uh, from Nebraska in, in a number of different ways. They have. Uh, uh, distinct challenges, they have different load characteristics, different po uh, populations, uh, but they have found the ability to work in an individual state manner uh, quite well. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the differences that they have. In fact, I think it probably uh, goes to show that any kind of a standard, national standard, uh, probably isn't going to work because these states need the ability to individually address their issues. And I take that probably one step further and one step down. Every state, if you have an RPS in a state, it does, uh, I guess, tighten up the flexibility that utilities need to have. OPPD, MPPD, LES, and some unions recently have made decisions on wind generation. None of them were the same. And they were all done for a number of different reasons uh, concerning cost and need. I think it needs to remain that way. Regarding our, our uh, perspective, I would like to lay to rest one belief that seems to be rolling around out there these days, and that's that the G&T and its members somehow uh, oppose wind generation and renewables in general. Uh, quite honestly, there's never been a statement from Nebraska G&T, and there never will be a statement from our office and our members that in fact uh, we oppose wind development. We don't. What we have said is, and many times quite frankly, is that we would like wind generation to be considered like any other resource. Be it let, evaluated on, on need and cost primarily, but just as every other resource in our portfolio it needs to meet those thresholds, and we just simply don't think they have to date. We're getting closer on cost, but we're not clear at all with the need for energy uh, at this point in time, at least in the state of Nebraska, or at least for NPPD who supplies all of our, all of our needs. Uh, we have cooperated in the past. From day one, we supported the Win Ainsworth Winds Farm, primarily in a research and development type of project, but we did support it. We needed a little more convincing when it came to a 10% goal for NPPD, but we have come to terms and have agreed to that goal as something that's reasonable. Um, and finally, our office is directly involved with Adam and, and others in placing two new uh, direct drive turbines in one of our member service areas a couple years ago. Yeah. So despite what's been said, we're hardly blindly opposed to wind generation. We simply want to address the development in a more logical and common sense fashion, where those who know the subject of resource planning are the ones that do it and can tell us how wind generation can benefit the consumers that we serve. Uh, and it's not 
I'd like to take the politics out of this if we could too. The rural field, the focus for renewables has been lost, quite frankly, over the past couple of years. We've been somehow stuck in this comparison mode of how many wind turbines we have or how many towers we have versus Iowa, Colorado, or Missouri for that matter. It was always our impression that renewables, and in particular wind generation, uh, was to, to be put up to limit greenhouse gases. And that was the whole uh, force behind this. If that's still the case, then maybe we need to be looking at what we have for emission-free generation in total. The resource mix provided by MPPD, which supplies us, right now they have obviously they have uh, coal primarily, nuclear, hydro, wind. But that portfolio to serve their native load in Nebraska, 47% of it today is emission free. You take a couple of contracts that are expiring in the, over the next couple of years for Cooper Nuclear Station, and we take that resource back, and that number grows to 55% or nearly. I'm not sure about anybody else's opinion, but I think that's a very impressive number. That's the number that we need to be comparing with other states, not the number of wind turbines that we've got hanging in the air. We really, uh, and I'm gonna reemphasize that, we really have no ax to grind with wind generation. If it's, if it's affordable and cost effective, I think it's a good, a wonderful opportunity. We just simply differ in opinion of where we're at right now, where we need to be, and where, how we get there. And you know, sometimes therein lies the problem. If someone takes issue with the concept or application of wind generation, they somehow are chastised as being anti-environment, anti-clean, whatever. The fact of the matter is, all of our consumers who elect all of our boards of directors are farmers and ranchers. They understand the natural resources that they're trying to protect. If they don't, they lose those and along with it, their livelihood. They have been good stewards of the land and water, and that's a good thing. I can safely say that the G&T and its members look for a reasonable approach to renewables, a cooperative approach, one that's cost-effective and provides phase-in that recognizes the huge investment that we've made in securing reliable resources on the behalf of our consumers across the whole state of Nebraska, city or rural. Another desire that we'd really like to have is a process that at least makes an attempt to take the politics out of resource planning. And we'd really appreciate that. Uh, provide somehow a basis for some common sense and logic to re-enter uh, the decision process. And as a discussion for future resources, and that's not just wind, that's every resource, be it, uh, be it renewable or not. Our members, uh, quite frankly, uh, have done a good job, an amazing job, when you think about it. They're out there uh, serving rural consumers with less than, or just about, right at two consumers per mile, just a little above that. And they're doing it at a at competitive price, a very competitive price. So I believe they, uh, they show wisdom, and I, I respect their opinions, and those are the opinions that I'm representing today. I thank you again for the opportunity to visit with you and, and present those uh, comments and perspectives. And uh, I'll tell you what I will do, I'll leave a pile of cards with Adam and, and if we don't get all the questions answered, feel free to grab a card and give me a call or send me an email. And I'd be certainly happy to discuss it with anybody. The fact of the matter is, is that, uh, and I'm speaking in, uh, in terms with uh, NPVD, the fact of the matter is, is we're long, as you mentioned, in generation, both capacity and particularly in energy. Uh, you look at a uh, previous comment that I made, um, the G&T purchases about, not quite, uh, 5 million megawatt hours from MPPD. Next year, they look to move in excess of that amount to market, or at least attempt to. 
Uh, you add wind to that, and it's not just simply add it on top and put it in the market. You run the risk that the market isn't going to be there, number one. Two, you've got transmission constraints, as we uh, Barry mentioned, uh, and a number of other things. Now, we can go out and purchase generation, but it really, economically, you all run businesses in this room. I'm not sure you would support spending money to purchase something that you already manufacture and have too much of, and you're essentially competing with yourself. That isn't good economics or good business sense, at least to me and my members. But I will tell you that uh, in response to a couple of things that Barry said, yeah, we've put in place in Nebraska and had supported those statutes that cha to change and allow for export of wind to other states. For some reason, we can't and companies can't get it done. It may be that there's already too much there. There is no, there, there must not be a market because we're, or one of two things, there's not a market or we're too expensive, one or the other. So I think we got to figure if we're gonna do something, we don't have enough load to take everything that's possible in Nebraska, that's easy to say. Um, in the same context, I'm not sure that we would be, should be forced to take something that we already have. That's the logic that I want people to kind of look at. So. If I understand the, uh, the question, that would be should we take into uh, to account uh, all the economic factors uh, of putting wind farms around the state of Nebraska. I think you could do that. I think the problem, and this goes back to a uh, kind of a finance economics background that I have. Uh, previously, at least to date, when you uh, get an economic or gener at the generation level, you, find, you make a decision that's economically good for all of your customers, it gets buried in the mix, and it comes out as a benefit to all who purchase power. In this particular case, at least to date, um, there, there's, it's, it's been an extra cost. It's cost more for wind than the other uh, resources in our portfolio. So what you have is uh, the economic, local economic benefits being gleaned by a smaller area but being paid for by a much larger consumer base. If we could figure out a way to spread those benefits back in a manner that everybody gets a piece of that pie, then I think you got something to go with. Um, maybe we can do that, we can talk about it, uh, but reality is um, I'm not sure everybody wants to pay for someone else's benefit. Just saying that as a suggestion. Um, but I think that's where it needs to start, is how do we spread those benefits around and uh, make sure everybody that helps contribute to the payment of it uh, also gets a better benefit.